Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, sounds like we're live, and um, I'm, uh, I have the pleasure of hosting a panel here for the, the fourth year in a row with the Singapore FinTech Festival. I wish that we were all together in Singapore, but I'm glad that we have the opportunity to do this again um, uh, here with all of you today. Um, we have a great panel today. I'll introduce my two panelists in a second. Um, as, as, as was said previously, this is a really interesting topic. Obviously, core banking and core banking transformation has been a topic that I would say many in the industry have shied away from for decades. Uh, they've not wanted to tackle this topic because of the expense, because of the risk. It was just too complicated and, frankly, a daunting task. And there's no question that the technologies that we now find, whether they be cloud, well, they are cloud-based and, and other new technologies, are really making people rethink the ability to fundamentally change their core banking technologies and their core banking architecture. So I think we're really entering a new era of banking facilitated um, by these new technologies, uh, whether it's around the customer experience, whether it's around productivity and cost, really around product innovation. There's just so much potential to completely change the infrastructure of core banking. Again, a topic that most institutions haven't wanted to touch for a long, long time. So we have two great panelists today and we'll get into it. Uh, first, we have Paul Taylor. Uh, Paul's the founder and CEO of Thought Machine. Um, he founded Thought Machine in 2014. Um, Thought Machine uh, then came out with their core banking engine vault in uh, the spring of 2016, uh, 2015, I'm sorry, to start this journey to help banks liberate themselves from their old core banking architectures and platforms. And we're really happy to have Paul with us today. Paul, thanks for joining. Thank and you. We, we have Derek White. Uh, Derek is vice president of global financial services for Google Cloud. Um, Google obviously goes without um, needing much introduction, but uh, Derek has a, obviously a key role there in the financial services um, uh, vertical, responsible for setting go-to-market strategy and partnering with banks, insurers, and other financial services companies as, again, they look at how to use new technologies to completely change the way that they um, are looking at the future and processing um, and, um, and developing strategy going forward. So, Thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, I think this will be an interesting conversation. Um, so why don't we start with where I, where I started, which was um, for many years, this has been a topic that organizations haven't wanted to tackle. Um, I think um, maybe as many as 12 or 13 years ago, some of the Australian banks started making big bets on core banking replacements using um, ERP technologies. Um, now fast forward, um, seven, eight, nine years later to 2021. Um, how do you think about the key differences between core banking replacement back um, in the 2013, 2014 timeframe and, and now? And what are the opportunities that present themselves now from a cost productivity as well as a risk standpoint compared to where we were uh, seven, eight years ago? So um, Paul, maybe I'll, I'll start with you and we'll just have a conversation. Yes, well, um, uh, it's good to be with you, everyone. Um, <clears throat> so Thought Machine is, is, is a cloud native core banking company. And, and what does that mean? And, and, and what does it mean in terms of a bank transformation? Well, first of all, uh, you know, cloud native is, is new to the banking world, but it's, should, it is not new to the world of technology in general. Uh, nearly everything in the technology world that is new is done on the cloud. And this involves uh, fr from Netflix to social media <clears throat> to everything. So. When we say we're doing uh, core banking in the cloud, we're building on the best practices that great cloud native companies like Google uh, did and invent and, and created, and they've created infrastructure which can be used um, for basically for any purpose. But the real advantage is that it it, it creates um, it solves so many problems that have uh, that have uh, plagued banks for a long time, as in reliability, uh, downtime, you know, upgrade paths. Uh, and how to create, you know, uh, fast innovation and, and really excellent user experiences. So the, the purpose of the transformation is to say, can we marry uh, the best experience, the best practice in the tech world with what banks need? Now, banks go through a natural cycle of uh, transformation or a natural cycle of upgrading systems. And it is only reasonable that, that as they enter this cycle and as they start to do this, uh, that they look to what to what is effectively the only the only game in town when it comes to uh, what is a modern system. 
cloud computing doesn't really compete with anything else. It just competes with this and stay, stay, staying as as you are. It, it, it isn't that while there are different cloud computing companies, you know, it, it, there's no rival uh, philosophy about how to build systems. So it is only natural that as banks uh, look to upgrade and uh, and look to do that, uh, look to modernize their systems, uh, that they turn to the cloud. And when they do so. Uh, they come to the cloud platform technologies and the and the, the vendors like Thought Machine uh, to upgrade their systems. Yeah, so I think uh, I just ahead. build on that, Paul and, and Bob. If I can chime in here, uh, it, it is uh, I, I, there's a convergence of trends that are driving the adoption of cloud and driving the adoption of cloud across the entire stack of technologies that uh, enable end user experiences, and, and those key trends are. One, customer expectations, customer demand, human use cases are, are driving demand in the ecosystems that Paul was describing that customers are increasingly interacting in digital ecosystems today. And that carries over then into the experiences that they expect from their financial institutions. In order to enable those end human user experiences, and it's important to call out here, those end user experiences carry across not just consumer banking, but it call, carries all the way across institutional banking and designing around that end human user is absolutely important. So therefore for financial institutions, in order to be able to provide the end user experience and to be able to monetize those end user experiences, we look at it both above the glass and below the glass. So what's the end user experience, but then what are the technologies that Paul just elaborated on and that, and that move to cloud that enable speed, the creation uh, of new products into the into for customers and the end users that and 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 a technology environment that accelerates the pace at which organ, uh, organizations banks can respond to the market the challenge with changing big legacy uh, uh, core banking systems as you referenced uh, the australian banks many years ago that was a multi year journey and, and that journey can take time. Uh, and so cloud is, has the ability to disaggregate and break that, that, that move to the cloud to de-risk that move so that it's not a one-shot bet in migrating from one large system to another large system, but uh, cloud significantly de-risks that migration uh, of, of core banking systems. And core banking can be defined as simply the ledger or moving all the way up the infrastructure and application stack into the end user experience. So Derek, you went where I wanted to go next, which so let's push on that a little bit, which is the business case. So I think Paul, you talked about the migration to cloud, but obviously the reason people are doing it is because of the business benefits. And Derek, you highlighted a few de-risking, uh, flexibility, ability to innovate, cost avoidance. Um, what what are you seeing? Just talk a little more, maybe Paul, go back to you because you didn't touch on this yet, but what are you seeing as you advise big financial services organizations around that myriad of, of um, advantages and where are you seeing people really build out the business case? Is it actually all of those or um, talk a little bit about the business case and, and the moving to the cloud? Uh, is, is, uh, you want me to go first? Yeah, Paul, why don't you go? Because you didn't comment before in business. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say, I mean, we are hopefully nearing the end of a global pandemic, as I said. Uh, hopefully the end is in sight. Uh, but, but, but when we look at the, the you know, what are the changes that have come? And uh, the cloud has been, uh, for loads of us in technology, the cloud has been fundamental to what has happened in the technology sphere. Uh, we talk about uh, Zoom, uh, we, we, we talk about uh, Netflix, we talk about all these things which are cloud native technologies whose traffic has exploded, and uh, but the infrastructure has kept pace. We then look at the banking world and we see that uh, it, as of today, they're doing well, but when the pandemic hit, uh, there was, the call centers were overwhelmed, there was emergency loans, business loans, all sorts of things happened and the banks re really struggled. Cloud is really about, you know, is about is stripping out too many bank processes are, are manual, too many bank processes, you know, are unresponsive, they take slow, they're too slow. The cloud, the cloud enables a massively faster response. 
And it, and it really is the same, you know, uh, uh, Derek said, uh, above the glass, below the glass, but it's the same thing. If, if the organization, uh, you know, internally can innovate at a particular speed and move at a particular speed, it means that the consumers uh, get the benefit immediately. And uh, we just cannot go back to a world in which everything moves at this glacial speed. We have seen the pace of change, uh, 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 you know, in, in, in other parts, and we've seen that it can be applied to banking, but we need to get the proportion of the banking world that's that's thinking that way, uh, you know, uh, uh, considerably higher, shall we say. Yeah. And maybe, Derek, I could ask you to, to focus on one point, which would be the, the implications for tech organizations. So as I think about this as a real operating model shift, right? You had infrastructure on-prem, now you have infrastructure off-prem. What does that mean to IT organizations from an operating model standpoint and from a cost perspective? Yeah, so from a technology standpoint, one point, I'll address that specifically, Bob, but one, one point and trend that we're really seeing is the, the coupling of the end user experience with technology and how organizationally that's coming together uh, within organizations is, is critically important. And the decision makers, so no longer are technology decisions simply made by CIOs and CPOs kind of below the glass, but it involves the business, business leaders the CEOs above the glass that are focusing on the end user experience and how to generate revenues, they're calling on technology uh, in a different way than ever before. And so the impact on technology organizations is, is, is simply understanding the decision makers have changed, but that, uh, but that these technologies moving from on-prem to, uh, to, to, to increasingly off-prem or, or cloud enabled is, so much of it is about, yes, the technology, but the real essence of it comes down to unlocking data. And how do we bring data back to the interaction level for these humans that we talk about? And we use the four C's of data to bring it to life. Because in financial services, we're really good at capturing data over and over and over again on the customer, right? We're really good at that. We're pretty good at cleaning data, right? So uh, Refinitiv, for example, has said that they'll spend $8 uh, on cleaning data and $1 on acquiring data, right? So there's a lot that's spent in investing in, in cleaning data and getting it out to the point of, uh, of compute and, and, and on edge compute. The third is on caching, on storing data. For a long time, there's been lots of discussion about data lakes and being able to show that the data is in one place or that it's preserved. But the real magic, real magic comes, and where cloud really accelerates this, is on calling the data. Calling the data back from wherever it may reside, at rest in an organization, how can it, how can it be called back to where the interaction is to inform the decision, decisions, to make smarter decisions, and to make smarter interactions that customers are expecting based on their interactions out in the ecosystem and measurements on how much financial services are actually using their data, calling this data, is anywhere between 50 basis points, 0.5% of the use of their data, to maybe 20%. And that's where we see the opportunity on calling the data, and so therefore technology organizations understanding how do they help unlock that data to bring it back to the, back to, uh, the interaction level Cloud unlocks that, unlike uh, on-prem environments can do. So, Derek, I'm curious. Then, does that imply that there's a fundamental shift in operating models and skill sets too? There's a lot fewer people that are managing data in-house, and there's a lot more people that are analyzing data and and doing analytics and and different types of analysis for business leaders. So, have more tech people move closer to the business or is the business just to be able to do that all themselves? It is a fundamental change in operating model. You, you only have to look at the trends of, let's just take a couple of data points on trends for a second. In the consumer business, one of the biggest trends is 40% drop in traffic globally in physical branches. 40%, call it. That, sh that traffic has shifted from the physical uh, or orientation of how the, how the industry was built into the mobile application or into their digital estate. Uh, that's largely for the consumer business. In, in institutional businesses, we see that, that it's largely do it together uh, experiences digitally. 
taking what were paper-based environments into an interaction model that is digital, where we're sharing glass like we are today on top of a complex transaction, but essentially crushing paper out of the organization. So understanding that trends, yes, this broader digital trend that we're this, this conference is discussing in, in so much, cloud enables and or cloud enables a speed of adoption of that, but it also helps change the operating model because the business leaders are no longer running traditional businesses that were operated off of 10 visits to a branch a year. They're operating off of businesses that are high frequency, high volume digital interactions, and therefore they need to understand their technology environments that enable the, the, the experiences and how they monetize customers in a different way. And so we are seeing the operating model and the connectivity of business technology and end user experience like never before, it's then having trickle and trickle down effect on how organizations are organized and operate. Paul, I don't know if you're seeing something similar on your side. Um, yes, I, 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 I think there's been a been a huge acceleration. And, and I think what's great about the cloud is it, it is, um, when I was having early conversations on the cloud, it, it, it was about, it seemed to be some sort of trade-off, as in, yeah, we get a cheaper hosting cost. Yeah, we get we don't have to do these things. But 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 what's worse? And uh, of course, I'm an evangelist, but I say nothing's worse. And 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 the but, but the you know when I so for for disclosure, you know, I used to be a software engineer at Google, and uh, you know, so it's, 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 so we do have a common theme. But, but there, you know, we spent all our time worrying about these problems about resilience, about, about how to upgrade a system when it was uh, when it was still running and things like this. And it all seemed like kind of nerdy, dweeby problems uh, that no one cared about. But the end result, it, it gets, it, you know, it it, it it removes the friction from, from how people do something and it just, and it just, just a, a, a enables a, a different way of working. Uh, one of the one of the I mean I, I I am new to the banking world. I've been here you know I've been six years and I've uh, uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. But but there's there's a sadness in the banking world that bankers don't get to do much banking because they get weighed down with all the problems of the technology and the legacy and the and all these things. And and our job at Thought Machine and I think in all the many of the B two B fintech companies is to solve these problems in a fundamental way, such that you know uh, the banking world can get around actually is spending its time on uh, giving you know consumer products that people really want and actually enrich their lives and 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 those those that are you know that, uh, that match people's needs and so on and so forth and there's just too much energy and there's too much cost spent you know, keeping the lights on in the old world and it, it, this is this is this is a dead weight so it's about removing that and it's about, uh, uh, you know, as I said, <laughs> too many bankers are just encumbered by the problems of technology. So it's removing that and allowing people to get uh, get on to what they entered banking to do in the first place. So Paul, let me stay with you, but sh shift the conversation a little bit towards execution, right? So we've, so we've talked about the fact that there's clearly a business case. We've talked about the fact that it's a fundamental shift for organizations. But fundamental shifts, especially in banking and financial services, are hard, right? So what, what are some of the risks that you're seeing that people need to think about as they consider this very significant transition um, from legacy to cloud? Well, um, uh, you know, do, managing risk well is fundamental to banking. And there should be nothing that we do that in any way makes the institutions uncomfortable or puts customers at risk. Or and uh, and we've had many conversations with the regulators uh, it, 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 to make sure that you know everyone's comfortable. And for sure that, that because of that things move at a slower speed. But 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 that's not an issue. The issue is that we get to the destination, uh, you know, in, in, in good shape. Right, so, so what do we care about? We we want to make sure that the bank works properly. We want to make sure that people have access to their accounts, nothing goes wrong, that payments work and on all these sort of things. And it's about proving, you know, over and over again that the security systems are there, the resilience is there, uh, and, and that uh, and so indeed, you know, the sandbox environments, there's various proofs in the market uh, that all this works. It, 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 so we go that far. And then we talk about security systems. So we talk, we show that 
um, you know, that if hackers, uh, you know, have privileged access, that it doesn't matter because the data is encryption, uh, encrypted at risk, it's encrypted in trans, uh, you know, transmission. And and unfortunately, you know, old banking models, you know, they've got this this thick wall mentality. It's hard to get into the bank, but if you do get into the bank, well, well, it it, it it's all exposed. Right, it, it, so you show the benefits of, of the extra security, the extra resilience, and you so, uh, and then it's just a question of how do we get there? And um, much of Thought Machine's business is with new banks, and thought, much of Thought Machine's business with its existing banks launching new mobile, um, uh, launching new mobile banks. And the hardest bit is is when you want to move customers from the old old world with all their transactions intact and all their products intact. So that is hard, but it is doable, right? And as I say, you know, banks do 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 actually do core banking transformations. It, it does happen. And it's a it's a whole a whole lot easier if you're moving to a modern platform than moving from one old platform uh, to another old platform. Well, is that is that customer problem? Is that a data technology issue, or is that a customer adoption issue? Um, sorry, if I understand your question correctly, you uh, just mentioned one of the hardest parts is the customer migration of all their information, and so. My, my question is really, are you saying that that's a challenge from a technology standpoint because of all the data, or is it a challenge because you then have to get customers, clients to be used to interacting with the institution in a different way from an adoption uh, standpoint? Well, well, from our perspective, uh, the end customer shouldn't notice any difference, right? The, right. Our, our, our goal is that mortgages works the same way, the credit cards works the same way. Uh, they may find it it's all, all a whole little quicker and they wake up on Sunday morning, they can still do all the transactions because the bank hasn't gone down for so-called regular maintenance. Right. Um, but but, uh, but that's about it. There's, there's nothing in here that, that wants to, for it's, you do see this, that banks move move systems and then customers get cut off from their historical transactions. Uh, this is a bad approach. I mean, uh, it, we should move people there and then, and then suddenly they find out they can do everything in their mobile app apart from just looking at the transactions and looking at the balance, which is uh, unfortunately too much of the experience. Derek, I'll go to you. Um, thoughts from you on, on execution and risks that our delegates should be thinking about. And, and one specific question I'll ask you maybe to touch on as you, as you think about it is, you know, a lot of my clients that I deal with, there seems to be this philosophical debate around is the best way to migrate to be a greenfield approach and then migrate to a new environment or to do kind of an incremental component approach to get to the new environment. I'm curious, both of your views on that, but Derek, why don't we go to you and, and talk a little bit about execution risk. And... Yeah, Bob, probably three points on, on execution just to call out. And, and uh, Paul did touch on this. But it, it ties, the risk ties to also where we're seeing the greatest demand. Uh, and as we look at the evolution of cloud and the maturity of cloud, we're moving into kind of wave three or cloud 3.0. And we're moving from the infrastructure storage compute cloud capabilities and shifting workloads into true transformation. And that's what Paul was talking about. It's looking at the end user experience. And so one of the themes that I would, I would suggest for risk on this is recognizing that this is that the, the cloud enables a fully threaded experience and simply looking at the technology and the technology below the glass is a risk. It's simply looking at it from a technology standpoint, because as you highlighted, Bob, it's not just about the technology, but it's about unlocking the data that enables a more amazing experience for the customer. So the first point is just that it is it is tightly coupled. It is fully threaded from the human to the technology and back to the human uh, in, in a, a user experience. The second is um, a full recognition of how cloud creates connectivity of your environment and that end user experience like, like never before. And then the third is more of a mindset thing than anything. And that's on the achievement and the realization of the art of the possible. The art of the possible of what technology and how technology can solve problems, how the cloud can, can solve problems, of uh, moving to the art of the possible rather than being encumbered by the history of the past. And that's 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 more of a mindset thing than than anything and being willing to make that move. Now, your question on uh, Greenfield versus um, 
uh, existing uh, environment migrated to um, to a, a, a cloud environment. And there are clear paths for both. And there isn't a clear answer for any organization because so much it comes down to the strategy of an organization. It is much cleaner to do a greenfield. And that's where uh, Paul indicated they've had incredible success within Thought Machine as are other providers, uh, core banking providers, being great success. And it is easier to spin up a new greenfield environment. I can tell you that within Google Cloud, we've had multiple established organizations looking to spin up their own uh, greenfield organization, not just on a cl cloud environment, but all the way through full stack and full end user experience. Uh, so there are new fintechs that are establishing, there are established players that are building out greenfields, but there are is, is also a very clear and very manageable path to migrating um, existing environments. So maybe I'll ask both of you to comment on your, your, your most compelling example or case study around where a client of yours has been able to, once they've put in or moved towards a cloud environment, been able to really innovate, right? Whether it was around product or around um, analytics to unlock value in their organization. I'd love to get our audience to be able to hear a little bit some a real granular you know, case around where somebody really was able to drive business value as a result of having gone through this migration. Maybe, Paul, I'll start with you if that's okay. Yeah, if I have to pick one example, I'd, I'd probably pick uh, Box in Hong Kong, which is uh, which has got, um, uh, uh, which is um, backed by Standard Chartered as, as a licensed bank. Uh, we've been working with Box for, for quite some time, but launched in September, you know, adding what, 15,000 customers a month, accelerating, and it, it is a completely different world uh, for what they could do. They can respond to things uh, so quickly. Um, uh, digital banking in Southeast Asia is, is a huge thing. Um, is Singapore has just announced some new, new licenses. Uh, I can't say exactly what our involvement is in that now, but, 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 but this is moving at a, a pace that is unimaginable, uh, you know, in the old world and, you know, thought machines, uh, we're very, very glad to be part of that journey. Great, thanks, Paul. Derek, you want to offer one? Yeah, unfortunately I can't share the client, but this is probably the most exciting opportunity that I, I, I could say. So just, just Google operates today, nine platforms, call it 10 plus platforms with over a billion users. Each of those platforms, operates and it has AI, ML, and cloud embedded in the very essence of how those platforms are built, the technologies that enable them, and how the billion users interact on those platforms. So tried, true, and, te and tested. So taking those capabilities and just say, for example, take the AI that sits on top of, that's embedded into photos, and how that we, how that we can take and identify that Bob is Bob, Paul is Paul, chicken is chicken, cat is cat. That AI capability and pointed at problems or challenges in financial services space. Now, in order to truly take advantage of that AI ML capabilities, having a cloud environment to take unstructured data and be able to use it is incredibly powerful. So an example of that, uh, we've got it in both lending doc AI and how we're, how, we're, how we're applying it to documents and crushing paper, but I'll give one specifically on anti-money laundering as to how we're looking at taking unstructured data in anti-money and AML. And instead of using rules-based engines in which uh, in financial institutions use today, using AI on the unstructured data and, and is providing phenomenal results. Three to five X the identification of false positives of what we have seen uh, elsewhere. Uh, so AI based models, instead of rules based models, all calling on a cloud environment that unlocks data across the organization, uses the data or calls the data as we talked about previously in a way that's never been done before is truly transformational. And that only becomes that it's only possible because the client was willing, customer was willing to truly explore the art of the possible of how you take scale proven technologies, 
point them at challenges and experiment with us uh, in a way at speed to bring something to market. Really exciting stuff. Thanks, guys. Those are both great examples. And unfortunately, I've just been told our, our time is pretty much up. I was hoping to get into a little bit of discussion around regulatory and privacy, but I think that this is a topic we're going to be talking about a lot going forward. And I'm sure we could probably have this same panel discussion next year at the thing of Singapore Fintech Festival, hopefully in person, and have just a more informed version of this same conversation. Because I think this is going to be the topic for a number of years to come as financial institutions migrate their legacy infrastructure, which is obviously a huge opportunity. So I appreciate very much both of you joining. This has been a great conversation. I, I'm sure our delegates uh, got a lot out of it. And again, I hope to see you live next year. And uh, thank you very much for participating. Take care. Thank, thank you. you.